Dante Certification Level 2, Second Edition. Helpful Network Concepts. In this chapter, we will discuss several short networking concepts that will help you better understand how things come together. To start, let's ponder this. Based on what we learned in the last chapter, let's suppose this laptop tried to reach this receiver. Now the answer is no, this connection will not be established. When the laptop sees the IP address of the server, it will recognize that the address starts with 192.168.0. That means the server is in the same subnet as the laptop. As such, the laptop would look for the server on the local network. It would not try to connect to the router, which means the laptop is looking in the wrong location. Now this is just one of the reasons why there are IP addresses reserved for your use on a local network. Many residential networks tend to choose one of these first two subnets, something in the 192.168 range or perhaps a 10. anything range. However, there's no reason you couldn't use 172.anything from 16 to 31. Dot anything. As a matter of fact, when you get to enterprise networks, IT managers are usually looking for more subnets or perhaps they start assigning meaning to particular ranges. So you'll certainly run into it there. Now when we look at these ranges, it's important to know that the first and last IP in your subnet are not available to be assigned for a network device. For example, if I have a network in the 192.168.1 range, we know that last field can range from 0 to 255. The first and last IP addresses should not be used, but anything else is up for grabs. It's also worth noting that it's a common practice to stack your permanent network assets towards the bottom of the range. For instance, the router is typically the first address in the range. From there, we might stack up interfaces for managed switches, Wi-Fi access points, and so on. The higher numbers are usually used for dynamic addresses using DHCP. Now there's no reason that devices have to fall into these ranges, but it shouldn't be a foreign concept of having this sort of best practice. I'm an audio engineer, and if I was running sound for a band, I could tell you what channel one on my console is, right? It would be kick drum. What comes after that? Snare, hi-hat, toms overhead, bass, right? A lot of the other audio engineers in the audience are probably saying these things right along with me. So the advantage of that is if I was to set up an event, but then I couldn't run it that night for some reason, somebody else could come behind me and take over quite seamlessly. Okay, quick quiz again. I'll offer some IP addresses and you tell me if these are available for use for devices on my network. Let's assume that we have a subnet of 10.1.1 slash 24. And if you need a little hint, that means we have a subnet mask of 255, 255, 255, 0. So, is 10.1.1.0 available for our use on this subnet? No, it isn't. The first and last IP addresses in the range are not available for our use. Okay, how about 10.1.1.15? Yes, that is totally fine. Okay, how about 10.1.1.300? Okay, this should be a pretty obvious no. The range of IP addresses in dotted quad form have to be 0 to 255, but of course the range of IP addresses we can use would be 1 to 254. Okay, so this is our last topic for this chapter, DNS. Now we know everything is contacted by IP address, right? So when I go into a web browser and type audinate.com, how does it get there? I'm sure we've all used our web browser typing an IP address, say when you're contacting your home router. So we know that this section can be filled with a domain name or an IP address. The rest is things like the network protocol. In this case, we're using secure hypertext transfer protocol. And the part at the end is the folder path or the request. Ultimately, your web browser will take this domain name and convert it to an IP address using the domain name service, or DNS. So DNS is like a phone book for your network. Right? You can go into a phone book, look up somebody's name, and get their phone number. Well, with DNS, we can offer it a domain name, and we can get their IP address. Here you can see the typical computer settings. Below the IP address, subnet mask, and gateway, you can see DNS. 
I've listed the IP address of two servers, one on my local network where I can host some simple names for servers that I'm going to set up, and the other is on the internet to handle everything else. Let's see how this would play out. Let's suppose I ask my web browser to go to avtech.ddm. That's a name I've given to my Dante Domain Manager server on the local network. Well, if this is the first time I've asked my web browser to find this server, it won't know the IP address of that device. So, it'll go down its list of DNS servers to resolve this. You can see I've listed my local server first, so we'll ask that server. Of course, since this is something I've set up locally, it knows the answer and reports back. My computer can remember that answer, complete the connection, and deliver the server's web interface to me. Now, let's follow along if I ask for audinate.com. Again, the first time, my computer won't know the IP address for this, so it will go down its list of DNS servers. Well, my local server only remembers the DNS names for local devices, so it will report back that it does not have the answer. No problem, my computer has another DNS server to check with out on the internet. That DNS server responds with the answer. My computer remembers the answer, completes the connection, and retrieves the website for me. So that's easy enough, but sometimes we start seeing IP setups like this, where the DNS server and the router are at the same IP address. So is this an IP conflict? No, the same device is going to act as your router and your DNS service. Now, typically, that device won't hold a lot of different names, but this gives us an opportunity to introduce DNS Relay. So again, let's suppose I ask the web browser for a website that we haven't used yet. My computer doesn't know the IP address to go to yet, so it looks down its DNS list and finds the IP address of the router. Okay, if this DNS service doesn't know the answer either, it will put this link on hold while it starts searching for the answer. It has the IP address of my local server, which of course won't know the answer here. Then it continues to the next server on the list that responds with the answer. Now our DNS service can take that original connection off hold, report the answer back, and from there things move as they did before. The web browser can now make the connection and retrieve the web page. Frankly, this type of cascading domain name service is not unusual. If you look in your computer, you might only see one or two domain name servers giving you the answers for billions of domain names out on the internet. The DNS servers you have delivering internet addresses might have multiple servers they link to, each specializing in .com, .net, and so on. And each of those might actually be pointers going to multiple servers as well. So DNS is a very scalable solution, and it's very easy if you want to add your own server to the local network to manage certain IP addresses for you. So before we move forward, we'll show a simple demo of a computer resolving a domain to an IP address. Now before I do, I'll give you a quick one or two minute tour of the command line with some tools that you want to know just in case you haven't used it before. On the PC, you can go to your Windows search bar and type CMD. That will launch the command line application. On the Mac OS, use the operating system's Go menu, select Utilities, and launch Terminal. I'll put these side by side so we can approach both at the same time. The first command that's really helpful is one that displays your own IP configuration. On the PC, the command is ipconfig. On the Mac, it is ifconfig. This will show you the basic configuration of all ports on your machine. At some point, you might end up with a lot of stuff on your screen. To clear it, on the PC, you can type CLS, or on the Mac, just type clear. Now there is a slight difference. The PC eliminates the history as if you've closed your old screen and opened a new one. On the Mac, the terminal app simply advances that old text off the screen. You can still access it if you want. So the next command we'll try is ping. Now ping just sends a blip of information across the network to a target IP address and that device will echo it back, demonstrating that we have two-way communication. Here in Dante Controller, you can see an IP address of a device we know is on the network. Let's ping that device to see what success looks like. I type ping, followed by the IP address. 
You'll notice that the Windows command will execute four times by default and then stop. But the Mac keeps trying over and over. To stop that and get control of your command line, just press Control C. Okay, one more tip. If you ever want to type a command similar to what you did before, try using the cursor up button and the system will show you the prior line you typed. You can edit it from there. In this case, I'll ping an address that is not on our network so that we can see what a failure looks like. Right, it says host unreachable. Okay, so let's bring this back to DNS now. Certainly, when I'm using the ping command, I can type the IP address, but I could also put in a domain name. Here, I'll enter audinate.com. When I do that, we'll see the command line will resolve this in the background, and then it will use the IP address it found from that point forward. No problem. Okay, so let's review what we've learned in this section. There are subnets reserved for your use on a local network. These addresses will not be found on the internet. Whenever you have a subnet established, there are some addresses to avoid. The first and last IP address in your subnet have meaning in the network and they are not available for use by network devices. For instance, if you have a 24-bit subnet, do not end your IP address in 0 or 255. All the numbers in between are fair game. We also know that it's common practice to stack permanent network resources low in the IP range, leaving the higher IP addresses for dynamic devices. And of course, we learned about DNS, which acts like a phone book. DNS resolves domain names to IP addresses. If multiple DNS servers are in the list, the network device will go down that list one at a time. This isn't a voting system, it just accepts the first server that comes back with a positive response.